sick. Father, this morning I pray that you would continue to minister to our hearts. Help us to uh, just gather in our spirits the ways in which you are directing us, the things that you want to teach us. Help us to be cleansed by the blood and to be washed in a way that would help us not to return to the sins that we've repented of. God, I pray that you would help us to have ears to hear what your spirit would speak, that you would guide us in a special way, Father, that we would uh, be keen to your spirit in such a way that we could reach out to the lost around us, to have an effect, to serve, to give, to give up ourselves so that you could do the work that you so desperately want to do before Judgment Day. God, I thank you that you offer salvation to all, that there are none excluded from your plan of grace, that are none excluded that you do not desire to save. Father, that we can't go so far on a mountaintop to get away from your presence or so deep into an ocean to escape, but you are there with us. And so, God, I pray that you would speak to us in the places that we are. Sometimes these are spiritual darkness places, places of turmoil and inner uh, character resolve that have us tormented and keep us from your presence. Lord, you said that when we sin, we are separated from you. And it is interesting, Father, that when we sin, we tend to run from you instead of running to you. When you are the Redeemer, you are the one who wants to bring us close again. Father, speak through your word. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Today I want to be uh, talking a little bit about Romans chapter 11 and 1 Kings 19. In Romans chapter 11, Paul is addressing an issue that has begun to develop because the Roman church is mainly a Gentile church and Christianity was born in Judaism. And there's a great transition going on. God has had a covenant with people and the, generally the Jewish people. Not that they were always Jewish. Ruth wasn't Jewish. Rahab wasn't Jewish. There's lots of famous people we don't often realize that joined the movement of God and the covenant of God that were Gentiles. It was not that Gentiles were excluded, but it was the original covenant, the first covenant, and at some point we understand that Jesus came to fulfill that covenant and to bring us into a new one. And so Paul is kind of discussing that with the Roman church since they're mostly a Gentile church. And he wants them to understand that transition. And he uses the terminology of being grafted in. He says the Gentiles have been grafted into the tree. In this picture here, we have an olive uh, tree that has been cut and it's been broken. But then little branches and shoots have been grafted in and they're growing just fine and beautifully, having been grafted into the roots. Grafting is interesting. I have memories of my grandfather, my mom's dad, uh, grafting trees. And I think that if I remember right, there was a lemon tree in the backyard that Grandpa uh, Blankenship had grafted a lime or an orange branch onto, and it had become this tree that was producing this uh, strange variety of oranges that had the sap from the lemons. And uh, it was delightful. Grandpa was good at gardening, and he knew how to grow all kinds of sorts of things and he canned peppers and he grew berries and he grew up uh, in Oklahoma and Texas so by the time he got to California he was very interested in making his soil useful for production and so I learned about grafting from my youngest age it was just something I understood that you could do and you could replace and that you could replace something that didn't naturally belong and put it into the tree and it could belong. And Paul here is beginning a journey in Romans chapter 11 of talking about how that was us. That we didn't naturally belong. That we weren't really part of the original plan or the original tree. We didn't come out from there. But God had specially selected us to be grafted in to this plan and to be placed in. Mike read for us a scripture about how God, through his spirit, has given us sonship and that we can cry, Abba, Father. We cry out to God as adopted children. We may not have been with him all our lives. I know for me, my Christianity is truly a conversion. I know that as a child, Christ was not my mindset. 
I know that I was not steered in a direction of thinking about God or Christianity. I was keen to the world. I understood Santa Claus and the Easter Bunny and the Tooth Fairy. And I was petrified when I found the teeth in a baggie in one of my mom's sock drawers that belonged to me and realized that she was actually an impersonator and that she was not the real Tooth Fairy. And I had to, at that point, try to figure out, did the real Tooth Fairy exist? And then when it came that I found my Christmas presents in their closet one year, and they were all already wrapped, and they were signed from Santa, but it wasn't December 25th, it rocked my world that my parents had been lying to me that there was no real Santa and that they were Santa. And it grieved me. I actually cried. I still remember that effect it had on me. And so Christ was not really part of my picture uh, we didn't have a nativity set set up that I remember as a kid. Uh, I don't remember, Mike remembers going to church, I think on a church bus with the Nazarenes, but I don't remember ever going to church. I think the first time I ever walked into a church, I was probably 13, from my memory. And even then, it wasn't a lasting impact. But my life is one in which I know that my experience with Christ is as if I'm one of those branches grafted in. I didn't belong. And yet God has helped me to belong. And so Paul's wrestling with these uh, mindsets in the Roman church because now it's gotten to the point that the Gentile church is receiving the gospel much faster than the Jews. In the beginning, they were all Jews. Jesus selected all Jews. Jesus was a Jew. The hearers of the gospel in the beginning were Jews. And that first church in Acts 2.38 were Jews. They were Jews gathered for the day of Pentecost. The Holy Spirit fell first on Jews. That movement of Christianity was all Jewish. And then the Gentiles started flooding in. And it was an amazing transition. And actually, it just exploded. The Gentiles were receptive. They were ready. They were eager. And the church literally grew in numbers. And if we read through the book of Acts, we see how it just grew and grew and grew. And people were excited about their new faith. And they were excited about being grafted in to this faith. You know, on a, a side note, uh, sin... Sin always separates us from God. And if we were to ask ourselves, why did that original olive tree get uh, taken away? It was taken away ultimately because of sin. It was taken away because of un unbelief and, and disobedience. And as God worked with that one covenant for so long and they resisted it over and over again, he eventually said, we are going to have to switch things up. And that's kind of the whole uh, theme we're going to walk along. But ultimately, it is sin that separates us from God. The Bible teaches us that when we sin, we're separated from God. The very earliest sin in the Bible was there in the garden with Adam and Eve. And we see that after they had sinned, that God walks in the garden. In Genesis 3, 8 and 9, it says he walked in the garden in the cool of the day. And his first words to them after they had sinned is, where are you? So there was a separation. Sin had driven them away from the presence of God. And it wasn't that God didn't know where they were. It was that God was beginning to uh, bring the gospel, if you will. In Hebrew, it's kind of neat. This is just for me, maybe. But in Hebrew, it's only one word. God spoke one word to them after they sinned. And that word is ayeka, which means, where are you? Ayeka. He wanted to know where they were. He knew where they were. Our almighty God who knows everything knew exactly where they were. He knew their condition. He knew what was going on. The question was not for God. It was for them to ask themselves, where are you? And that's because God had already in that moment, in that one question, began to seek after them. God seeks the lost. And he asked them, where are they? And the question itself provokes a confession. The very first thing God does is seek out the sinner, but then he provokes in their heart a confession. He says, where are you? And they say, we're here feeling naked, and we covered ourselves with leaves. Well, who told you you were naked? 
Who told you you were exposed? Who told you that you were in a state of shame? Well, we ate of the tree. And we know how it all begins to un unpack itself there. And, and so God has begun this whole one-word question that evokes him seeking them and their confession and the beginning of what we call restoration. Immediately, our God, in his great mercy and his great love, takes the two human beings that exist on the earth and he begins the plan of restoration. I want to restore you to a great relationship with me. I want to take you from that place of sin that you went that separated you from me and I want to bring you back into my presence. You know, Josiah, as he was teaching Sunday school this morning, he brought up a cool verse, and it was about how you resist the devil. Come near to me, God says, and I will come near to you. When we resist the devil, when we begin to deal with the sin in our lives, it, the best way to deal with it is to get under God's umbrella again, to get near him. And as we get closer to him, he's our protector. You know, if the, if the struggle, and sometimes the struggle is with ourselves, but if the struggle indeed was a spiritual struggle, or a battle, there's nothing more than you want in life than to be part of a team. I know in my work as a police officer that when sometimes we're in areas where there's large crowds and they go awry, it's not good to be in a crowd when things are getting riotous and to be alone. But all of a sudden, if you look back behind you and you see three or four of your teammates with you, then you're emboldened and you're ready to deal with the situation. When we are in sin and we're alone, it's very hard to wrestle and to get out of it. But if we can look back and see where the presence of God is and go closer to him and embark ourselves under the umbrella, the shadow of the Almighty, then we'll have strength again to stand in the battle. And that's all God really wants. That's his restoration his redemption, and he's always seeking for that for us. So in this text, and I'm going to read Romans chapter 11, 1 through 5, Paul is wrestling with the idea that what is happening to my people? My people are the Jews. I'm Paul for a moment. My people are the Jewish people, and they seem to be not grasping this message the way they used to. And the Gentiles, they seem to be taking hold of it ferociously. He says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So Paul says, did God reject the Jews? And he says, no, he didn't completely reject them. Look, I'm a Jew. Yeah. He's speaking to a Gentile audience. And he's saying, God hasn't, respect, he hasn't rejected all the Jews. I myself am a Jew. And he says, I'm not only a Jew, but I'm, I'm of the tribe of Benjamin. He gets specific about how God has selected him. God did not reject his people whom he foreknew. Don't you know what the scripture says in the passage about Elijah? And that's why we're going to go on to eventually... Uh, Elijah, you've run ahead of me <laughs> really far. <laughs> um, but we're going to go on to about Elijah. How he appealed to God against Israel. Lord, they have killed your prophets and torn down your altars. I am the only one left. And they're trying to kill me. And what was God's answer to him? I have reserved for myself 7,000 who have not bowed the knee to Baal. So too, at the present time, there is a remnant chosen by grace. And we're going to get into that story and understand it. But basically what Paul is saying right now is that I realize that here in the Roman church there seems to be a wave of Gentile Christianity that is strong, but I want you to understand that God has not fully rejected the Jews and that there is a remnant reserved for him. And he pulls back a story about this guy named Elijah and he says, remember when this happened with Elijah? And we're going to kind of, kind of talk about that story. But before we do it, I want to talk about this. We just had our Super Bowl World Series. I mean, our uh, World Series. And the, I don't know if anybody's a Houston Astros fan, because I don't know if we have any Texans in the audience. Maybe somebody out there. I'm really a Padres fan, uh, so I'm a mess. But... Um, <laughs> 
The Astros won last night, but why I wanted to bring this up is, is the, the Padres Stadium. It's the Petco Stadium. And, and uh, when I grew up in San Diego, just, I didn't really grow up there, but I grew up in the mountains, but when I went to Barber College, so I was a young adult, I went to Barber College in downtown San Diego in what was called the Gas Lamp District. Now, at the time when I went to Barber College, the Barber College I went to was built in the 1800s. It was a third generation barber school of Sicilian Italians, and they were amazing, okay? And so, but the, the downtown San Diego was a slum. I some, saw some of the worst things I've ever seen in my, my life during that period, uh, when it comes to sexual sin, prostitution, and drugs, um, it was gross. And it was, there were a lot of homeless people and there was a lot of yuck. And so the Gas Lab District was not a good place to go. But the uh, city decided to go under revitalization uh, and to change the image of the Gas Lab District. And they began to uh, tear down buildings and erect new ones and they, and they changed the whole neighborhood. In the process, with time, they decided, the Potters decided they wanted to build a stadium. And so when they were building the stadium, they wanted to do something different. San Diego has this rule, and that is, if you're going to build a high rise or any great structure, it has to be unique. And it, it can't be identical to anything we have. So that their skyscape is very beautiful and very unique. And if you ever get to see it, it's worth seeing. But the, the, the stadium builders and the architects took this in the mind and they decided that they were gonna take this building that I remember being there when I was younger uh, and they were gonna incorporate it into the stadium. So today that building is still there. It's where some of the box seats are for the stadium itself. And they decided that instead of tearing it down, they were gonna build around it and they were gonna restore it and renovate it and do a little bit of replacement. And so they, they, they attacked this, this picture in a, in a unique way. But really what I wanna use that as an illustration of is God and his theology and the way he works. And so God does a lot of things when it comes to realizing that uh, man has made a mess of his work. Man has departed from him. We have gotten off his direction. We've, we've ruined relationship. And so God starts working through these concepts of, okay, we need to restore the relationship. Restoration. Restoration is when you take something and you make it like it was. If it's an old car, you're going to restore it. You're not trying to make it different. You're just going to shine it up. You're going to maybe change some parts that got rusty. You're going to uh, do a new paint job. You're going to do things. But when it's all done and you've restored it, it's going to look just like it was. And sometimes God works through the powers of restoration. Other times he does renovation. When you think about renovation, we think about a house maybe and you're going to renovate a house and you come in and there's aspects of the house you like, but there's aspects of the house you don't like. There's old parts of the house. So you knock a wall down, you add a new sink, you say, hey, this house is so old and only had one bathroom. It needs seven if it's for the fishers. And so if they're ever going to get to the bathroom, they better have at least four bathrooms. And so you start thinking about new ideas, but you keep part of the old and you put in some of the new. Now replacement is a whole different idea. Bulldoze the whole thing. Knock it out and use the property and let's do it all different. We've got to change the way this is. And very little then is left with the original. Well, this is God. You know, I'm not talking about buildings and cars. This is how God operates through time he decided that he needed a new covenant. And so in that new covenant, he had to make some decisions about how it would operate and who would be part of it. And so he had to build on the past. He had to, to uh, begin to think about what's going to happen with my relationship with mankind. You know, there's a curious verse in, in another uh, phase of acorn on Wednesdays we're studying through the book of Ezekiel and that's a challenging book to study through and Tommy is leading us through that and it's fun it's confusing it's hard but we have fun and we eat pizza and we have fellowship and it's good anyway but there are verses in there that really knock you and this is one of them and we probably won't get there if we're going at the speed that Richard has been going through first Corinthians we probably won't get there for a couple years but here in Ezekiel chapter 22, verse 30, it says that God is looking for a man among them that would stand up in the hedge and stand in the gap before me for the land 
that he should not destroy it, but he isn't finding any. So the uh, picture that God is giving is that I have a wall and I need someone to stand in the gap. There's a, there's a broken part of the wall. There's, there's an issue with our defense. There's an issue with what we've built here. And I need somebody to stand in the gap. I need somebody to protect the hedge. But I can't find anybody. And so this is kind of where God was at when we get to the point of Ezekiel, which is the Babylonian captivity. This is where the transition really begins because the people of Israel, that covenant people, go into captivity. And when they finally come out, and, and in the decades that follow after the Babylonian captivity, and they try to rebuild, and they try to renovate, and they try to replace, it's not till Jesus gets in play that there's a real rebirth of what God wants to do with his people. And you see the my last word there is recruitment. So in the end, God is he's looking for people. He's not only trying to restore things, to renovate things, to replace things, but he's doing recruitment. What am I talking about? Well, I'm talking about a lot of things. I'm giving you theology. At the same time, I'm giving you what our job is here right here at Acorn. Okay. We are members, some of us, of a church that's been around for a long time. And we have choices to make. We can say to ourselves, I want to restore this church the way it was. I want it to be just like it was, like that old car. I want to replace the muffler that's rusty. I want it to be just like it was. Or we can have a mindset that I want to renovate it. I want to keep some of the aspects we had, but I want to knock down a wall here. I want to change some of the things. Or we could be, hey, let's just start over from scratch. We're, we, we're in a new age and a new generation, and let's just wipe out everything we used to do and just start from a whole new position. All of it's going to take recruitment. Yeah. Okay. And so you might have different feelings about what should be the focus of ACORN's future. And this is what Paul was dealing with as a church as a whole. When Paul accepted Christ and understood Jesus was the Messiah, he did not think he was embarking into a new church. Paul never thought he was switching religions. All he did was perceive that the truth of a Messiah has been placed in his life and he was living towards that picture. All he understood is that God had a covenant with his people and they had broken it and they had divorced him and now God was reestablishing a new covenant with his people. And so for Paul, it, it wasn't, it wasn't uh, uh, two different locations. It wasn't a question of, well, there was that church and this church, or there was this religion and that religion. It was a linear line of development. It was a relationship that Paul had with God, and he was just continuing on that journey, acknowledging his faith in Jesus the Messiah. There's a picture of this. You know, what's funny about the Old Testament is that it's so full of pictures of the New Testament. Maybe you remember me saying, some of you, but I'll say it again for those who've never heard me say it. If I was stuck on that desert island and never could get off and I had the choice between only having one testament, the Old Testament or the New Testament, me, Jeff Fisher, I would take the old any day of the week. Because anything that I can find in the New Testament, I can show you in the Old Testament and more. The Old Testament is three times in size and it's rich. And the grace that God gives us in the new is displayed in the old. Everything in the old comes to birth in the new. Now, there are certainly stories in the new that I love and appreciate. But if you put me in a hole and said you only get one, I'm taking the old. And if you want the new, I'm not holding that against you. But here in the Old, we have so many examples. And if you read the New Testament carefully, you will find all the New Testament office, authors are always referring back to the Old. They're always using the Old to build up the New. They're always saying this is the way it used to be or these are the lessons we should have learned. This is the way it was done before. This is the way it was done with so-and-so. And this is the lesson we're supposed to learn from that. And so the New Testament authors were not into replacement theology. They didn't want to wipe the whole thing out and start over. They were more of a mentality of let's graft in this new thing. 
Let's build upon this new thing. They weren't into complete restoration. Let's just restore the old way. They, the, the New Testament authors weren't saying, let's reconvene the old covenant and make sure everybody gets circumcised and make sure everybody tries to follow the Torah to a T. No, they weren't into full restoration. So it's interesting how they built upon the things that were learned in the past. And in this case, Paul and his struggle about what's going to happen with the Jews and what's going to happen with the Gentiles reaches back to Elijah. He says, do you remember there was a time in the life of Elijah? And if you wanted to kind of follow around, I won't be reading a lot. I'll just tell you the story. It's in 1 Kings chapter 19. Elijah had been a prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel, and the northern kingdom of Israel fell away from God sooner than the southern kingdom. In general, if you were part of the northern kingdom of Israel, you were usually weaker in faith and weaker in your traditions and weaker in your covenant with God than the people in Judah. Well, Elijah was a prophet to the north. He was a, a prophet to the people who had departed from God and began to worship the gods of the land, the Asherah poles and Baal. And Elijah was an indignant fellow. He got angry when people stepped away from God. He, he was frustrated when people didn't show God full devotion. He was, he was going to stand up for God every chance he got. And he did amazing things. God empowered him to preach, to teach, and to have the authority with power that would change the world of his time. He called down on one time and prayed that it would not rain on the land, and it didn't rain for three and a half years. I mean, in an agricultural society, it wasn't a time when people could make their money throwing digits into the internet or on a computer. It was a time when everybody's focus in life somehow evolved around what the God of thunder and lightning would do to their land. Yeah. And in this case, it became dry. And Elijah had proclaimed that it would happen before it happened. And so they knew that it was Elijah's God that had caused this to happen. And for some of them that didn't believe in Elijah's God, they just blamed Elijah. It's the God that Elijah represents, but we don't worship that God. We worship Baal. We worship Astra. But we can be mad at Elijah because Elijah has cursed us. And they're frustrated with him, and they're searching for his life, and they want to kill him. And he calls them up to the famous story that many of us in Sunday school may have learned, the Mount of Carmel. And he says, let the God who is God answer by fire. You build your sacrifice to your God, and I'll build my sacrifice to my God. And the God that truly answers by fire, he is God. And if we know the story, it ends by the fact that the worshipers of Baal, they beat their own backs bloody. They do all kinds of ritual dances. They jump, they hoop, they holler, they do all kinds they can, but they cannot get fire to come down from the heavens and lick up their sacrifice. Wow. Elijah builds his sacrifice. He douses it with water. He's almost like showing off. It is kind of like he's showing off because when they were building their sacrifice, Elijah's on the side saying, where is your God? Maybe he's on vacation. Why aren't you getting any results? Is your God sleeping? And in the Hebrew it says, is your God relieving himself? And I don't mean sleeping. <laughs> and so he's mocking them, and now it's his turn, and he goes to the opposite extreme, and he douses his offering with water. And of course, if we know the story, God does answer by fire. He licks up the offering. Immediately after, of course, the crowd is in awe. They're like, man, the, the God of Elijah, the historic God, the, the God that Elijah is trying to restore a relationship unto us is indeed God. The God that Elijah preaches is indeed God. And they're waiting for what's next. And Elijah says, take all the prophets of Baal and Ashtoreth, bring them down to the river, and we shall kill them. And they kill them. They kill the false prophets. That seems extreme maybe to some of you. But it was the way that God had chosen to purify and to get the people back on track. And after all that massacre happens, King Ahab runs back to his wife Jezebel and reports to her what had happened. And she's furious. And she says, the same thing that he's done to my prophets shall be done to him. And she sends a messenger to find him and tells him, Elijah, what you've done to my prophets shall be done to you. Your head is mine, basically. You're going to die. 
And so when we get into this chapter of 19, Elijah is gripped with fear. And he runs. The Bible tells us that he runs and he runs, and if we did a miles count, he, he went about 95 miles. And that's a long way to go when you're on foot. And he gets to where he's going, and he basically collapses, and an angel attends to him. And the angel wakes him up and feeds him miraculously with a little cup of water and a little cake of bread. And then he sleeps a little bit more, and then the angel feeds him, and, and then he gets up, and the angel says, you need more strength for your journey, and Elijah runs some more. And he heads down south about 130 miles. He's really getting out of Dodge. When he first stopped and the angel fed him, he was in Judah, where you think he would be safe because he had gone to where people are more, a little more on tune. They're, they're, they're a little bit better with their religion. They're a little bit more indoctrinated. Maybe they're halfway there. But the problem during this period is that Jehoshaphat, the king of Judah, is now associating with Ahab, and they're even going to go to war as allies together. And so Judah's got lukewarm faith and lukewarm covenant at best. And so Elijah continues his fleeing, and he goes all the way down, basically to the area where Moses had met with God, basically to the same area where Jesus had spent his time in the wilderness and wrestled with the temptations that would embark with him. And by the time all this happens, Elijah ends up 40 days and 40 nights without food. Does that remind you of anybody else? Jesus. Jesus. Does that remind you of anybody else besides Jesus? Moses. Moses. Okay. Moses, Jesus, Elijah. Now, who was on the mountain transfiguration? Elijah and... Uh, Moses and Jesus. Okay. There's something interesting about these little parallels. But in this one... And we're going to go to verse uh, 10 or 19, it's 9a of 1 Kings 19, 9a. It says, and the word of the Lord came to him. What are you doing here, Elijah? It's kind of the same question God asked Adam. Where are you? Except this time it's, what are you doing here? Is it that God didn't know what he was doing there? Is it that God was not in tune of the political situation of Elijah's time, that the government was falling apart, that they were no longer seeking their God, that the people had a focus in the wrong direction? No, God was fully aware of all that. Was he not aware that e e e Elijah felt alone? What are you doing here, Elijah? He replied, I have been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death and the sword. I am the only one left, and now they're trying to kill me. So Elijah has gotten into this mental frenzy when he thinks that he's the only one left. And God's going to tell him, you're not the only one left. I've got 7,000 others that haven't bowed their knee to Baal. And so going back to Paul, what was Paul talking about? He was talking about a time in which you think you're the only one. He was talking about the Jews who he started to think, am I the only one, God? You, you called me, I'm a Benjamite, but the Gentile church is exploding. The, the Jewish church is persecuting us. Am I the only one left? And he gets to that point and he realizes through this story with Elijah that when Elijah thought he was the only one left, God said that I have 7,000 times as many as you think you have. You're not alone. You're not in this battle alone. But he wants to deal with Elijah and, and sometimes before God can deal with your spiritual problem, he has to deal with your physical problems. Sometimes your physical problems get in the way of God speaking clearly to you. It doesn't have to be that way. God can speak to a blind person just fine. Okay? But sometimes the blind person is not receptive to hearing because he can't see. Even though seeing has nothing to do with hearing. 
And so sometimes it's true, God has to deal with your physical problems before you're receptive enough to deal with the spiritual problems. But if you were more mature, then you could actually deal with your spiritual problems first. But in this case, God has to feed Elijah. He has to take care of Elijah, and he has to speak to Elijah. And he tells Elijah, okay, I'm going to pass by. And so we get to verse mm, 11b. And God's getting ready to pass. We'll just start with 11 for sake. The Lord said, go and stand on the mountain in the presence of the Lord, for the Lord is about to pass by. Then a great powerful wind tore the mountains apart and shattered the rocks before the Lord. But the Lord was not in the wind. So the Lord kind of puts Elijah in this cave and he says, there's going to be a passing by. I'm going to let you kind of taste a little bit of my presence because, you know, no one can see the full presence and glory of God and live. And so sometimes God kind of passes by, or as he told Moses, I'll let you see my backside. Okay. And so when God lets man kind of encounter his real presence, there is a uh, protective force, and he kind of, in the Moses occurrence, he says, he shielded Moses' eyes as he passed by. Okay. Sometimes we don't realize how great our God is. And, of course, he's interacting in the physical realm so that we can understand it, but the reality is, is God doesn't even interact or have to interact in the physical realm. He, the physical realm was, was created for our perception so that we can understand things, so that we can say, well, I understand what cold is because I can touch something cold. I understand what hot is because we can touch something hot. But in the spiritual realm, it's deeper than that. God's not dependent on our physical realm. That's, that's our crutch. Everything physical is our crutch. But in this case, a powerful wind goes by and it splits the mountains. Surely God would be in that. Surely God would be in a power so forceful that it would tear a mountain apart. But the Bible says he wasn't in that. And after the wind, there was an earthquake. Surely God would be in an earthquake. The whole room shakes. I remember in the New Testament, sometimes when the Spirit moves, it comes like a mighty rushing wind. And the whole house where they were was shaken like an earthquake. But here it says, nope, God wasn't in the earthquake. And after the earthquake came a fire, but the Lord was not in the fire. And after the fire came a gentle whisper. When Elijah heard it, he pulled his cloak over his face and went out and stood at the mouth of the cave. A gentle whisper. You know, the Hebrew in there is a little challenging, and depending on what version you have, yours may not say a gentle whisper. It might say a still small voice. It might even say a gentle silence. It's the sound of muted, crushed silence. The words there that are used are intertwined with the words of dust. I don't know if you've ever experienced this. I think it's one of the fantastic things. When I grew up in the mountains and it would snow and you'd get that foot of snow on the ground and if it was powdery and you'd go out and walk in it. If it was icy, you'd hear your footsteps. Crunch, crunch. But if it was a true, dry, cold, powdered snow, you step in it and you can't even hear yourself walk. The best you might hear is your creaky knees if you're like million. <laughs> Now, there's some of you, I know when you come into the building because I can hear your bones creaking. <laughs> but powdered snow. Have you ever sat in like a rocking chair and you're in the window and the, the rays of light are coming through and, and your eyes are able to focus on the little particles of dust in the light? Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> Sometimes you're like, man, no wonder I get boogers. <laughs> because there's that much dirt in the air, you know, there's that much dust in the air. But it's quiet and it's beautiful and it's dust and it's just there and you see it for the first time. That's the kind of silence we're talking about. That's what Hebrew is conveying. And all of a sudden Elijah knows that's where God is. This time, God's in the silence.
Silence can be terrifying. But that's where God was. And when he spoke, he said, again, second time, Elijah, what are you doing here? God had never asked him to flee. And he replied the same way he replied the first time. I've been very zealous for the Lord God Almighty. The Israelites have rejected your covenant, broken down your altars, and put your prophets to death with the sword. I am the only one left, and now they are trying to kill me too. The Lord said to him, go back the way you came. So in this case, when we're talking about what God advises Elijah, he wants him to return. He wants him to restore. I want you to go back to where you were. I want you to get a hold of where you were. I want you to grab hold of what, what you had when you were on the mountain. When you were there boldly in your faith, dumping water bucket after water bucket on an offering and proclaiming to a whole group of people that could have smashed you in a moment and telling them that the true God will answer by fire. I want you to go back, Elijah. But then go to the desert of Damascus. When you get there, anoint Hazael king over Aram. Also anoint Jehu, son of Nimshi, king over Israel. And anoint Elisha, son of Shaphat, from Abel Meholah, to succeed you as prophet. I'm replacing you. Wow, that's bittersweet. This is the end of Elijah. This is the end of the story. He runs off and he anoints Elisha. And then very soon thereafter, he's getting caught up in the chariots of fire and it's over. His mission's over. And it makes me wonder when I think about this story. <laughs> you know, in, in the early verses I didn't read, he's like, I've had enough. Take my life. It's too hard. And God says, okay. I wonder if he had regrets. I wonder if that was a pity party and all he really wanted was compassion and a pat on the back and to say, hey, you're doing a good job, Elijah. Get back up there and fight again. Did he want to play another game, another round? Did he want to see the, 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 the team to the end? Did he really want to go? I don't know. The Bible doesn't tell us all this, but it does tell us that he gets replaced. And so Paul is delving into this subject and bringing it up when he's thinking about Israel because he realizes from the transition of Elijah to Elisha was a whole new era. And that the covenant that God had with Elijah would be transmitted to Elijah in double proportion. Those of you who might know the story of Elisha, he says to his master, Elijah, he says, uh, as he follows him and follows him and follows him and he finally crosses the Jordan and Elijah says to Elisha, what do you want from me? And he says, I want a double portion of your spirit. And he says, well, if you see me when I leave, you'll have what you got. And Elijah gets caught up in those chariots with God and he tosses his mantle, that hairy cloak or whatever it was, and Elijah grabs it. And as we read on in the story of Elisha, we see that he indeed receives that double portion of the Spirit. Within, embedded in them, if we studied it out deeply, we would see that Elijah is a representation of the Old Covenant. And Elisha, whose name means salvation, is a representation of the New Covenant. And that Elijah was replaced with Elisha. And that many things that were pertaining to Elijah, Elisha would do, but he would do them in greater ways. And so in this concept that Paul is struggling with in Romans chapter 11, he's realizing that this is the way God operates. When God spoke to Moses and established his first covenant and realized that the people should not go into the promised land, he rose up a new leader to replace Moses. Who was that new leader? Joshua. And guess what Joshua's name is in Hebrew? Yeshua. Yeshua. Guess what Jesus' name is in Hebrew? 
Yeshua. And so we have these pictures in the Old Testament of God showing that there's going to be Old Testament and New Testament. There's going to be the Old Covenant and the New Covenant. I'm going to operate with people one way and then I'm going to operate a new way. But when I do it in the new way, it will be by the process of grafting new people in. It will be by the process of replacing some, restoring others. When Jesus was telling parables once in Matthew chapter 21, verse 43, he wraps up one of his parables and he tells the audience, which is all Jewish at the time, he says, Therefore I tell you that the kingdom of God will be taken away from you and given to a people who will produce its fruit. He who falls on the stone will be broken to pieces, but he on whom it falls will be crushed. When the chief priests and the Pharisees heard Jesus' parables, they knew he was talking about them. They looked for a way to arrest him, but they were afraid of the crowd because the people held that he was a prophet. And so during Jesus' ministry, he begins to depict this, this transition that is happening between Israel as a church and the Gentile church. And he's letting them know in some of his parables that the kingdom of God is going to be stripped from you. There'll be a remnant. You could be with us. You could be part of the new thing. You can be part of it just like Paul was part of it. And Paul was a mighty powerful part of it. He was Jewish through and through. And he got to be privileged to do many things and many exploits and even leave us so many of his letters and thoughts because God used him. He was part of the old covenant and he's part of the new covenant. That's amazing. But Jesus is hinting that if you don't get on board, you'll be left behind. If you don't get in with this new covenant, you'll be replaced. He says simply, I am going to use those who produce the fruit. It's like the trees with my grandpa. I don't know. I don't have him around to ask him anymore. I wonder if maybe one of the branches he sheared off in the beginning might have looked like it was dying anyway. Maybe it was one of those branches that needed pruning. And he took his little saw and sawed it off. And I can still picture the, the, the branch he put on. It was significant in size. So. Of course, I was small, so who knows what significant is anymore. <laughs> and he had a, a brace for it, like a crutch under it, and he had bound it in some way or fashion. And it was producing fruit. You know, in Romans chapter 11, where we started, Paul goes on, and it's a really worthy chapter to see his struggle, because he really loves his own people. He says in 11.17, if some of the branches have been broken off, that's his family. That's his culture. That's his people. And you, though a wild olive shoot, an, a wild olive shoot, the Romans, the Gentiles, have been grafted in among the others and now share in the nourishing sap from the olive root. Do not boast over the branches. In other words, he's dealing with the dynamic of two types of people in the church. There's the old covenant people in the church and the new covenant people in the church. They're the people that have been there all along trying to walk with God, that have embraced the new message, but then there are the people that have not embraced the newness and they've been broken off. And now he's saying, well, some of you new guys are getting dangerously arrogant. You've been grafted in, sure enough. But do not boast over those branches. If you do, consider this. You do not support the root, but the root supports you. You will say then, well, branches were broken off so that I could be grafted in. Granted, but they were broken off because of unbelief, and you stand by faith. Do not be arrogant, but be afraid. For if God did not spare the natural branches, he will not spare you either. Replacement. We stand in faith. Our privilege to be part of the body of Christ operates by faith. 
And the moment we begin to think that we are selected because of something apart from faith, we're in danger of being pruned. It's by the grace of God that you're part of the tree. Yeah, at Acorn, it's interesting because we do. We, we kind of have the old camp and the new camp. I see the camps already developing. And some in the old camp are good, man. They're like, man, I'm, I'm actually all those still here are significantly good because the ones that were in the old camp that really didn't like it, they left a long time ago. Okay. But there's still kind of this pull going on as we begin to experience our own changes. And the old camp's like, can't we do it the way we used to? Can't we restore it back to that shiny Cadillac the way it used to look? And then there's another group that's kind of like, well, maybe we need some renovations. And then there's the new group that's like, man, we just need replacement. Just wipe them all out. Cut it down and let's start over. <laughs> Where's God? He doesn't desire that any should perish. And he is really excited about people like Paul who were part of the old covenant that are saying, take me, Lord. And he's really excited about the new people that were never in the covenant, that once walked in darkness but now walk in the light. And so we've got to have a lot of grace towards one another. Because we're just a tree supported by the roots. And the roots are Christ. So how do you stay supported by the tree and, and stay in the right side of this whole thing? Well, you uh, be fruitful. How do you be fruitful? You serve, you love, you pray, you forgive, you speak. You, 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 you show the fruits of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control toward one another mostly towards those who it's harder to do. If there's someone in your life that you find hard to show those fruits toward, that is the very person that you need to focus on. To stay in the vine, you need to be faith-filled. That's what made you grafted in. And you need to fear God. Because you're not guaranteed. If you're going to be unbelieving, if you're going to be filled with divisiveness, if you're going to hate the uh, other branches, then you're probably going to find yourself unfruitful, unbelieving, offended, eventually crushed, and it's going to become apparent that you don't fear God, you actually fear people. You're more concerned about what people think than what God thinks. I hope that made sense. I hope that uh, you're able to glean a little bit from that passage. It would be well worth it to read all of Romans chapter 11 to put it in a little more context. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this morning. Thank you for those gathered here today. Thank you, Lord, that you have grafted us in because you love us so much. Thank you, Father, that through faith that we can stand secure in you. Lord, obedient to your will and to your way. Father, I thank you for what you're doing at Acorn. I thank you for the new and the old. I thank you, Father, that you have done that from the beginning that you have demonstrated that over and over and over again in the scriptures, that we don't have to plow the entire field. We can build on what you've already given us. Lord, help us to be pliable, though. Help us to be able to change. Help us to be flexible. Help us to be receptive. Help us to discern what is good change from bad change. Help us to know which bean hill to fight on. And to realize that sometimes we might be fighting for our own desires. And other times, help us to be bold enough to fight for your desires. And to be indignant and to stand up for the cause. Lord, help us never to feel alone. For you are indeed building your church despite us. Father, thank you for your goodness and your love. Thank you that with one word you call us back. You ask us, where are you? Where do you stand? Why are you here? And with such powerful questions, you cause us to be introspective. And we begin to ask ourselves the same question. And through it, we confess our sins. And you show us the way of redemption. Father, we love you. Help us to love one another. In Jesus' name, amen.
Amen. Thank you, Pastor.